I am delighted to welcome you to the session that deals with the uh, equity markets uh, in, in Norway, the Oslo Stock Exchange as a listing destination for international shipping. Uh, this session, uh, it's a very comprehensive session covering the whole topic. We're starting with a presentation by the Oslo Stock Exchange, and then we have a panel of distinguished bankers and international issuers listed in, in Oslo. So uh, I will uh, welcome uh, Eric Hoiby uh, Ausland, uh, the Executive Vice President and Primary Market Head of Listings in Norway at the Oslo Stock Exchange. And Eric is going to, uh, to make uh, a presentation. Uh, Eric, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Nicholas. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Eric Hoiby Ausland. I am the EVP Primary Market in Oslo and Head of Listing Nordics in the Euronext. I'm very pleased to be here today uh, at the Capital Link Maritime Forum Norway to give a brief introduction to Oslo Börs as a listing destination for international shipping companies. So I will just share with you my presentation. Uh, there we go. And this. All right. So before uh, we move on to uh, the core of this short introduction to the Oslo Stock Exchange, I just wanted to say a few words about our group, Euronext, and I will get back to why this uh, is uh, of importance for uh, international shipping companies. So Euronext is basically a pan-European stock exchange group consisting of the stock exchanges in Paris, Amsterdam, Brussels, Dublin, Lisbon, Oslo, and as of quite recently, Milan, the, the Borsa Italiana, which was acquired by uh, Euronext. With this, we have 1,850 companies listed in total, uh, with a market cap of approximately 5.1 trillion euros, which makes us the by far largest stock exchange group in Europe. Um, while we have the most companies within the blue chip the Eurostox 50 index, uh, we are also the home of more than 1400 SME. Uh, so it's a diversified exchange and with a little more than 300 companies listed on the three main exchanges in Oslo. We are not the largest exchange in the group in terms of number of companies. However, if you have a look at the listing activity over the last few years, you can see that we have 53 new listings in Oslo last year. Mm -hmm. And if we move on to have a closer look on just Oslo, we can see that year to date, we have already had 34 companies admitted to trading. And this presentation was, uh, this slide was produced a few weeks ago. So the number has actually increased to approximately 40 by now. Also, looking at the capital raised last year, we reached a record of 9 billion US dollars uh, uh, raised in equity capital markets over our markets. Uh, so far this year, uh, 4.5 billion uh, US dollars has already been raised. So, Oslo clearly stands out as an incredibly active market. But what, what is really uh, the, the reason for that? So, first of all, uh, this exceptional activity is uh, by no means ours, the Oslo Stock Exchange's merit alone. However, we have definitely some experience in running a stock exchange after 200 years uh, and trading in shares and bonds since 1881. Um, we have been a private company since 2001 when we were, uh, and, and in 2007, we merged with the Norwegian C Central Security Depository to form uh, a group uh, with a full product offering in, in uh, stock exchange uh, business. Today, with our four marketplaces for listing of companies, we definitely make a contribution to a capital market that is very recognized for its uh, efficient capital raising and listing processes. Ranging all the way from the entry level MOTC list, where you can raise capital and register on the list with only, uh, within a couple of days, to the extremely active Euronext growth market, where you can do a private placement and the formal listing process in approximately 10 business days, after some preparations, that is, and uh, ranging all the way to the two regulated markets on the left-hand side here, being Oslo Bors and Euronext Expand, 
uh, which are fully governed by the EU rules, so, such as the EU transparencies and prospectus regimes, but you're still able to list uh, within uh, only three to eight weeks of a formal listing process. Again, with some necessary preparations on the, on the company side. But briefly, in terms of other main differences between these markets uh, is that the NOTC list is basically a registration list uh, where you can enter order interests, etc. It's self-regulated by the Oslo Stock Exchange. The registration process is done by an investment bank that, that uh, assists you with the product placement, and you will have to report annual reports and, and inside information to the market. Now, the growth market is a multilateral trading facility. Um, you will have to be assisted by a Euronext growth advisor to list on this market. That is mainly all the Oslo-based investment banks, at least of a certain size. Uh, on that market, you can enjoy a simplified admission process and documentation with less extensive due diligence requirements than on, on the regulated market. Um, also, there are no requirements for IFRS on, on this uh, market. On the two uh, fully regulated markets, the Oslo Bourse and the Euronext Expand, mm -hmm. you will have to prepare a full EU prospectus, you will have to report according to IFRS or US GAAP. Uh, you will have to reach certain minimum requirements such as 500 shareholders, two independent board members, etc. So th this is just a backdrop on, on, on our product offering. But if I should try to sort of summarize what it is that really distinguishes the Oslo market uh, compared to other markets, before we move into the really shipping specifics, I would say that it is that we have a substantial number of highly qualified investment banks, corporate lawyers, uh, regula regulators, all of them basically ready to assist companies of pretty much any size in their uh, journey or quest for financing. And I will get back to, to sort of the maritime cluster aspect of, uh, of this. This has uh, led to uh, Oslo becoming a very international market. We have issuers from all around the world listed. And as you can uh, recognize, uh, based on the list of, of countries or jurisdictions that are represented on the exchange, there is quite uh, a good representation from jurisdictions that you will see are familiar from the shipping uh, uh, space. Just to give you a quick overview of the sizes of the market, uh, in terms of the equity capital market on the Oslo Stock Exchange, uh, it, um, it, it accounts for a, more than 100% of the Norwegian GDP, uh, which uh, you will see relative to other stock exchanges, means that we have a, we have a very large uh, stock exchange market, market compared to the economy in Norway. And uh, also for bonds, we have a very active market, not at least for high yield bonds. And there will be another session on this, but I will also touch briefly on it uh, towards the end of, uh, of this presentation. Uh, but of course, in order to attract this kind of activity, you need the investors. Uh, and we, together with the investment banks, uh, have them as well. Um, with, for instance, with the domestic arm of the government pension fund, Folketrygfonde, as the largest investor represented on, on the Oslo Stock Exchange, and a very sound mix of uh, Norwegian, Scandinavian, US and UK-based investors, um, the access to capital is really far beyond what you would expect in a relatively small country as, uh, as the Norwegian one. So what is it that makes all of this so interesting and, and beneficial for international shipping companies? Well, obviously, Norway has a long-standing history within the maritime sector. Basically, ever since the Vikings conquered Europe in the 9th century, We've had a great involvement and influence in the shipping sector. Now, the Vikings, they weren't really risk adverse either. Uh, and that's something I, I believe to a certain extent runs in the DNA of Scandinavians, also the investors. And, uh, and as you know, the, the reward, at least for the Vikings, were, were quite huge. So it's probably no coincidence that they found a Viking ship when they built the new financial district in Norway, which basically postponed the whole development. But let's not talk about that today. The, the fact is that uh, I, I believe at least the way we have managed to combine a strong maritime history, including shipbuilding, ship management, maritime know-how in general, with finance, with the regulatory side, uh, is what has led us to, to where we are today, being probably the strongest maritime cluster globally. And 
to sort of uh, build a little bit on, on that. Uh, this has, has led to, to a, a market leading position also in terms of capital markets. Um, we are a, a number one when it comes to the number of companies listed in the shipping sector. Uh, we are also uh, among the world leaders uh, when it comes to other ocean related segments, such as the energy and seafood sector. And within the energy space, you have both the oil and gas, but not at least also the renewable energy sector. Uh, with this, we also see some very interesting synergies between all of these ocean-related industries, both when it comes to technology, but also when it comes to the financial side. Today, uh, our marine or maritime equity franchise consists of companies from, from a wide range of uh, segments. We have uh, uh, the tanker segment, which is uh, uh, really substantial on the Oslo Stock Exchange. We have uh, bulkers, we have LPG, we have LNG, and uh, not at least do we have companies like MPC containers uh, uh, within the, the container ship space and, and quite a good variety of other type of shipping companies as well. To, to, uh, to, to conclude, I, I included a short uh, note on, on the bond market as well, which is very active for shipping companies, uh, where the current outstanding volume amounts to approximately 6 billion US dollars, divided between approximately 40 bonds issued by 20 companies from seven different jurisdictions uh, within eight different subcategories. So quite a diversified market there as well, with some very interesting opportunities for financing. Um, and with that, I will basically conclude this short introduction to the Oslo Stock Exchange. And I look very much forward to follow the upcoming panel with some of the most prominent members of the shipping industry represented. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Eric, thank you very much for this uh, very uh, interesting uh, introductory presentation, setting the stage for the discussion. Our panelists are on board, uh, and uh, I would like to turn over the floor to um, uh, Anne. I don't see her uh, coming on. So Anne Dal Friesack, the uh, partner at uh, the law firm of Barr. Uh, thank you for uh, moderating this panel. Uh, and I will let her introduce, uh, we have a great uh, group of panelists and thank you to all for, uh, for being with us. We have, uh, bankers and the international companies listed in Oslo, terrific panel. And again, thank you for all the grand work and for moderating the panel and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Nicholas, and uh, thank you to Eirik for a very good presentation. The presentation was a good uh, introduction also for the topic of the panel discussion that we will have uh, now, which has the headline, Leading the Way in Raising Equity Capital for Global Shipping. And the panel definitely represents some of the most uh, qualified people to discuss this topic, uh, and I want to start by introducing uh, the panelists. So we have with us Matthias Borgeby, Listing Advisor, Primary Market at the Oslo Stock Exchange. We have Fredrik Falk, Head of Shipping, Corporate Finance in Arctic Securities. We have Herman Hildan, Managing Director Shipping in Clarkson Plato Securities. We have Willem Hededal, Director and Partner and Co-Head of Shipping, Investment Banking in Fernley Securities. We have Perry Van Eftelt, CFO in Hafnia. And we have Konstantin uh, Buck, CEO in MPC Container Ships. So Norway definitely has a long tradition of being a leading shipping nation, and it's the leading securities marketplace for shipping and the preferred listing venue for some of the leading shipping companies of which MPC Container Ships and Hafnia are represented here today. I wanted to uh, start off uh, today's session with discussing the attractiveness of Oslo as a listing destination and the background for this. And I want to start off uh, by receiving input from uh, you uh, on this topic, uh, Matthias, uh, representing uh, the Oslo Stock Exchange on this panel. And Eirik also briefly touched, up, touched upon this in uh, his presentation. So 
Uh, Matthias, uh, what are your considerations uh, on why Oslo Stock Exchange has become such an attractive listing destination for shipping companies? Uh, thank you, Anna, and uh, thank you to Nicola and Capital Link for organizing. I, I think um, Eirik summarized it quite well, but it rests, I guess, on a few few pillars. Uh, one being the flexibility of, of listing in Oslo, uh, given the the market structure of, of Oslo Börs, where you have the regulated market on top, and then the secondary market with with your next growth and uh, and then OTC list, which really allows for both smaller companies and larger companies to to list uh, list in Oslo quite effectively um, with with not a too heavy burden in terms of the listing process and also what we think is quite essential, which is speed to market, right? So so within. Uh, from the listing application from eight days to, to or 10 days to eight weeks, uh, basing up, basing, uh, based on which market you, you choose. So that's the one part. And then we'd say probably the, the second part, which is quite important, and probably the rest of the panel can attest to, is the fact that you have a very strong cluster of, of, of uh, investment banks, advisors, uh, legal advisors, and so on, that basically allows you to do everything through Oslo. You're not uh, reliant on, on being present, every, present everywhere in the world. And you can basically list your company uh, going through Oslo alone. And, uh, and we think that's quite unique. Thank you for, uh, for that, uh, Matthias. Uh, Fredrik, any reflections on your side? No, I, I definitely agree. I, I hope you can hear me. We, we have a very advanced technology system in, in Arctic. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to, to keep up with, with all, the, all that. But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you can, you can I, nod I if you hear me. perfectly fine. So that okay, good. Fine. So then, then, I, then I feel much more comfortable. Well, I think uh, I definitely agree. And uh, I think one, one of the uh, issues, uh, I, I mean, I was an analyst myself for, for seven years uh, on the shipping sector and uh, I, I learned then and I think even more now that a lot of the international investors, they rely on, uh, on Norwegian based analysts in the, in the shipping sector. Uh, so uh, uh, in addition to all the flexibility you have, you get very good support if you are a uh, a, a, a shipping company uh, being listed in in Oslo. Uh, I think also um, uh, the market caps in the range of uh, 200 to 500 million US dollars is uh, probably a uh, a small and and uh, uh, market cap in the in the uh, on the New York Stock Exchange or the Nasdaq. Whereas in Oslo, you will actually be a, a, a quite significant player. Uh, so. Uh, I think for everyone who, who is, let's say, in the mid-sized segment, uh, Oslo Burst makes a lot of sense for, for many aspects. Thank you, Fredrik. Wilhelm, any considerations on, on your side? Yes, I can add a little bit to that. First of all, I think uh, Eirik's presentation was, uh, was really good, and especially the the comparison to how it all started with the, with the Vikings and uh, and the risk appetite. You know, this this industry is 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 volatile for sure. And uh, what what we are seeing is that it, it's not only you know a lot of activity within shipping when uh, when rates are strong and asset values have started to move, but it's also quite a lot of activity when when the when the market is is distressed and and asset values are, are low. And that's where you need these call it uh, mostly I would say Norwegian Scandinavian investors with risk appetite who can go in and, and really make a, make a punt uh, when, when others are really not uh, quite there to support, to, to support the sector. Um, of course, also with, the, uh, with the, as mentioned, uh, with the hub and all the listed, uh, listed companies and, and the investment banks following the sector also, you know, during up and, and downturns, not as in other markets where you may, where I would claim that you see um, attention on the sector uh, reducing when the, when the earnings and, and sentiment is poor. Uh, you, have, you have basically a market where, where issues can come, uh, present their case to, 
First, the sales force at the investment banks who, who know the industry, know what they're talking about. The, the hurdle is sort of low to get, get the message across. Then you get on the road and you meet the investors. Same dynamics there. They, they know the industry and, and sort of pick up on the pitch uh, quickly. And, uh, and that's an important, um, important uh, or that's important reasons why why this this market is uh, receptive to 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 new shipping companies looking to raise capital but also of course existing companies looking to to raise more capital thank you uh, Wilhelm. um anything to add uh, from you Herman? no i think i very much agree with what Frederick and uh, Wilhelm has mentioned i think the Obviously, the, the stock exchange in Norway has been has been highlighted. This is very flexible and very quick. And I think in, in shipping, one of the key success factors is, is being able to to grab the opportunities when they are on the table. And in that context, I think the, the, the also listing creates a competitive advantage for companies in, in growth mode. And then kind of maybe uh, when you reach a certain size, uh, larger exchanges kind of make, make uh, a different argument for why that makes sense. So I very much agree. Thank you, Herman. Uh, let's then move on to see how the listed companies we have with us today think around uh, this topic. MPC, Container Ships and Hafni are both listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange now uh, on the main list. And to start with uh, your Konstantin, uh, it would be uh, very interesting to hear the background of uh, your choice of Oslo as a listing venue for MPC companionships. Sure, thanks, uh, thanks Anne, and obviously thanks also to Nicholas and and the team at Capital Link to 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 having us here. Um, obviously, we um, M MPC has basically a, a German uh, background, German uh, sponsorship with MPC Capital, which itself is listed actually on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. So, um, we, we we actually did quite some work in in deciding what is the right venue actually to 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 grow a company, and and I think for for, for the very purpose of MPC container ships, one reason was that we basically wanted to create something that has a very speedy process to the market because we, we had identified an opportunity which, which rested upon a certain constellation in the banking sector, a certain constellation in the container shipping sector, and therefore I think the, the speediness of the process was one very determining factor on, on, on that part. And then obviously the Oslo Stock Exchange and, and uh, Eirik alluded to that and, and others as well has obviously established itself as, as one of the key uh, hubs with international recognition for companies in the shipping space. Um, um, and, and also the, the investors um, have a certain educational background in terms of being prepared to take um, asset decisions and asset risk. And, and I think for a platform that owns um, assets, real assets in shipping, that's obviously one of the, the key ingredients. But maybe, maybe let me add a, a few additional aspects. So obviously, you know, it has been an impressive track record, um, what companies have been able to raise and, and how they have been able to position themselves, basically, especially in the growth phase on the, on the Oslo market, that is, is very important. Um, so, um, as I said, an important stock exchange uh, is, is, is Oslo in that respect. Then the entrepreneurial mindset of growth companies and, and new ideas uh, li like we did with MPC container ships, I believe matches perfectly with the, the as I said, well-educated entrepreneurial mindset of the Nordic investment community. So another key aspect. Um, and, and then obviously the professional surroundings. And, and, and that's something that, uh, um, uh, that Matthias mentioned as well. Um, where we said, you know, look at the different players. I mean, the, the investment banks, some here on the panel, as well as the law firms and the stock exchange itself. Um, I'm extremely pragmatic, very efficient. And, and I think someone referred to it as the Norwegian capital market DNA, which, which I would, would very much um, 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 under, underline as well. So, so I think that, that is one thing. And then lastly, obviously the the time to money time to market in combination with uh, also being actually the first container shipping company on the Oslo stock exchange we believe that was an innovative step it brought something new to the stock exchange which is obviously also good because you um, you can obviously argue rather be listed where your peers are but it's also good to be listed uh, where, where you basically are on the radar of everyone who wants to get exposure to the container market so that's 
kind of a, a list of aspects that that led to our decision to 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 go to Oslo. Um, and on that note, back to you, Anne, um, uh, and thanks for that. Many thanks, uh, Konstantin, for uh, for giving us insight uh, on that. Uh, Perry, what about uh, Hafnia and uh, your choice of, uh, of Oslo as a listing venue? Yeah, good day, everyone. Um, I think much has already been said, and uh, and I agree with that. But maybe as a quick background, Hafnia Tankers and BW Tankers uh, merged early 2019 to combine into an integrated product tanker owner and operator, um, owning around 100 product tankers in the LR, MR, and handy segments, and commercially operating another 80 ships in our commercial pools. Um, upon the merger, the company was, and still is actually, majority owned by BW Group, which um, uh, is a shareholder, a major shareholder in a few other companies in Oslo as well. And for the rest, we're predominantly owned by private equity investors. So from the merger, we had um, a clear objective to obtain a stock exchange listing for both growth, but also providing a platform for our shareholders to trade. Um, of course, there was already a, um, a registration on the Oslo OTC market, but there was very little trading. Um, in preparing for the listing, we indeed considered a few stock exchanges and ultimate, ultimately chose for, for the Oslo Burrs. Um, I, I think most of it has already been said. Uh, Norway is a large base of investors that traditionally are very well educated in and familiar with, uh, with shipping investments and the dynamics of a shipping company. Uh, that includes both retail and private wealth investors, investment funds, and the pension funds that Eric already uh, showed in his presentation earlier. Also mentioned strong infrastructure, infrastructure of banks and law firms uh, that cover the sector really well and tend to have an appetite for, um, for these types of transactions. Also a good antenna for timing of the market. Um, on top of that, uh, uh, very important, especially as in other markets you see um, the coverage of equity analysts being dropped on shipping. In Norway, you have a very wide range of um, investment banks and, and equity analysts that follow that sector. And again, all, also already mentioned a, a very proactive uh, approach from the, uh, from the stock exchange in Oslo and a very smooth working relationship. So all in all, it was um, um, a few obvious reasons to choose for Oslo. Thank you, Perry, for, uh, for sharing uh, these uh, reflections. So moving on uh, then from the topic of, topic of, uh, of Oslo as a listing venue to the topic of raising uh, uh, equity through private placements for Oslo listed companies. Oslo listed uh, companies can uh, quite efficiently uh, raise additional equity through private placements. And, and I think there are definitely certain unique features uh, in terms of raising equity through private placements in the Norwegian market. And I think it would be interesting to hear the panelists' uh, perspective on this. So, Willem, if, uh, if we can start uh, with uh, you and if you can uh, comment on, you know, the typical Norwegian process for private placements for Oslo listed companies, as well as the benefits of the Norwegian capital market in, in terms of raising equity for shipping companies. Uh, yes, yes, sure. So, just sort of... Uh... 10 seconds on, on what, what is the private placement and I guess the, the, the main differentiating factor from a, between the private placement and a, and a public offering, if you will, is that you avoid the use of uh, prospectus in the offering. And that is, that is quite uh, efficient for the, for the process and uh, it makes it um, more, more speedy. Uh, more uh, document light, obviously, uh, and as as Constantine was alluding to, you're 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 able to to time the market in a way, uh, or uh, time the market, which is important when you're in a volatile sector where rates and earnings and values are moving quickly, where and where investor sentiment is is changing rapidly. And also, I remember also with with MPCC. Not only did they have an acquisition opportunity that they wanted to move on, it was also a, a competing case in the Norwegian market that uh, was basically looking to do the same thing and they had to be extremely quick in order to sort of uh, take that demand off the table before, before that competition. So basically through the private placement route, and that was then for a non-listed company, right? Because it was a private company 
one thing to, to list, but it's still a, we're still talking about the private placement. You can quickly um, um, prepare an investor presentation and the term sheet and application document, which was basically then the, the marketing material. That was done in, in a few weeks, two or three weeks, and, and the roadshow was, was set up and um, the equity was, was raised in, in one or two weeks. Um, MPCC also chose to go uh, NOTC first uh, back in 2017. It was either the NOTC or the, or the Merkur market, which is now the UNESCO growth, but the Merkur market hadn't really you know, sort of started to, to become as active as today. And, and the NOTC market was really the, the entry level market. It, it's still an option, I know, but the more, more activity today on, on the UNESCO growth. So it's, it's, a, it's an equity raise method that, that has all the benefits for the issuers in, in terms of um, grabbing the opportunity when it's there. At the same time, it's, and that's also based on what we have discussed so far, it's a, it's an, um, it's a uh, way of raising equity that also has the quality stamp for the investor. So, you know, you need, you need both of those to be able to have a successful uh, capital raise because you want to get the investors on board, of course. And, and it's the perfect balance between the, the quality and the process that the investor wants and and the um, efficient, efficient uh, efficiency that the that the issue needs, and in between here, if you add on um, uh, the listing, which is then NOTC, your next growth, um, you have uh, the Oslo Stock Exchange, which is the you know fantastic team player and 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 facilitator and. And uh, you know, not the uh, call it the bureaucratic uh, obstacle that the one may may meet in other marketplaces, uh, uh, other in other countries, and uh, and 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 altogether, um, the private placement route um, has has clear clear benefits. Also for listed companies, um, the private placement route is is uh, the the um, the choice. Um, I think personally, I. Now for all the equity raise transactions I work on, nine out of ten is uh, is a private placement. Um, you 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 see an opportunity in the market, uh, and on short notice you want to to grab that opportunity. And if you have to throw in a a, a public process with the prospectus, uh, that opportunity is, is is quickly lost. Of course, when you are when you are listed or you want your shares to become listed, at some point the prospectus is needed. But uh, on your next growth, uh, that is not needed because it's not a full exchange, it's a multilateral trading facility. On the NOTC, it's an over-the-counter market, so it's not, not needed. But when you get to the expand or the Oslo Burge, the, the exchange is, sorry, the prospectus is needed at some point to, to, to get the shares listed. Um, so that's sort of the initial thoughts from on my end why, why the private placement route is, uh, it's the most common uh, common track. Thank you, thank you for that, Wilhelm. Uh, Herman, uh, reflections uh, on your side? No, again, I, I fully agree with what Wilhelm is saying. I think there's uh, kind of the the reason why the private placement is the kind of most active form of, of raising capital for companies in our industry, I think reflects a bit the dynamics of our industry. So, uh, so I think nothing more to add than that. Uh, it's well summarized by Willem. Fredrik, anything to add from you? I must say, I think uh, William uh, particularly and also Harman covered this topic very well. So uh, I, I think uh, I'll, uh, I'll save my comment to the next uh, topic. Thanks, uh, thanks, Frederick. So, uh, moving on to you, uh, then uh, Perry. Uh, Hafnia completed a private placement uh, pre-listing. Can you share some reflections on your experience in connection with the private placement that you did? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it's been mentioned uh, throughout the panel already a few times. Um, uh, timing is is very important in the equity capital markets transaction or an IPO. It's crucial that you have a very short uh, time to the market. 
because the, the, the windows in ECM, they can open and close uh, very rapidly uh, depending on what, what's happening in the market. So in order to manage the timing of the transaction, we opted for, uh, for a direct listing on the Oslo access uh, preceded by a private placement offering. And this had uh, significantly reduced the pre-marketing periods and therefore shortened the time to market because you don't have to go on multiple, uh, multiple roadshows and you can do basically the private placement offering uh, simultaneous with the, um, with the preparation for the direct listing. So together with our banks and the lawyers, we prepared for the transaction. Um, one process focused on the private placement and the other one on the preparation of the, um, of the listing, uh, being predominantly the prospectus and all. Uh, we went on roadshow ahead of the private placement. Um, over a few weeks, we met institutional investors in Norway, the rest of Europe, and in the and in the US. And ultimately, we did a private placement of $230 million, including the green shoe, um, where we raised $75 million for the company. And the remainder was basically a, a secondary offering by the existing shareholders. Um, and then uh, very shortly after, we obtained the listing on, uh, on the Oslo Stock Exchange. Um, obtain, uh, upon obtaining also the required number of investors, we also moved very shortly after the uh, Oslo access listing to the main board, which was in April 2020. For us, this was a very effective way to raise capital um, and obtain that listing with a manageable time frame. And in addition, uh, very importantly, also reduce the execution risk of the transaction. The whole process, cooperation with the investment banks, the lawyers, and the Oslo Stock Exchange proved to be a very smooth one um, and cost efficient as well in comparison with other uh, listing venues. And still, um, while listing in, in Norway, uh, post transaction, we saw a good mix of institutional investors, both from Norway uh, and the Nordics in general, uh, the United Kingdom, the rest of Europe, and, uh, and the United States. Thank you, uh, Perry. And uh, Constantine, you have also completed several private placements uh, over the years, and it would be interesting to hear also from your side on uh, on your experience with uh, with these processes. Sure, and 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 again, without repeating everything that that has been said, I, I share a lot of the experiences that that Perry has brought forward, and also what what Willem and and others said. But but maybe very specifically in our case, I mean we. We basically took took the full uh, lot and and started NOTC with a private placement, then uplisted in in April 17, then uplisted to the Mercury market, um, and then to the Oslo Stock Exchange. Uh, back then, Oslo Access uh, that was in in May 17, um, and then we moved up to um, uh, to the main board of the Oslo Stock Exchange early 2018. So so within only 12 months, we we went through. Through the different layers of, um, let's say, the Oslo Stock Exchange, being a company that has back then started on a blank sheet of paper. So I think that 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 says it all um, in terms of efficiency of the market, um, in terms of, you know, uplisting, and also in terms of tapping the market. We conducted until this date, so so over four years, we conducted seven um, equity races, most of which were private placements, um, and and raised uh, north of of half a billion US dollars. Um, to, to basically, and I think this is one point that, that has been made, but maybe to do it even more specifically in our case, it's always, you know, if you want to move in the windows open, you want to secure assets. And at the same time, you want to secure funding and, and synchronizing those two steps is, is obviously the, the art of, um, um, of, of the game, so to say, right? And, and I think that with the time to market, timing the market properly, um, being able to already line up things with a, you know, with a, uh, with a, with a, basically with a book in the background, um, in terms of investor appetite, etc., and then you know launch an overnight private placement is is an extremely efficient process, and we have made very good experience on that, um, especially to make use of opportunities in a growth mode. And I think this is. Um, this is an experience that, uh, that that we have had since 2017, from from the start of um, the, the first equity raise um, until today. 
Um, and I think this is uh, this basically speaks for itself how, how efficient that market is. And then obviously the slim documentation to which Willem alluded as well um, is, is extremely uh, good for an issuer because you can you can basically you know prepare and concentrate yourself on on the transaction and on the execution, and not uh, um, with regards to to kind of turning various rounds with uh, with the FSA etc. Et so so I think very good and and that confirms Perry's uh, comment earlier, also broad range of investors. You will definitely with the slim documentation not tap on a private placement has not tap all investors on this globe, but there's actually a very uh, a broad investor reach globally um, that, that can be facilitated as part of such a process because of the very good focus of uh, also the banks. Thank you, Konstantin, for uh, sharing these uh, reflections. So to raise capital, whether as part of an IPO or, or through later private placements, the uh, investment banks uh, play a vital role in, in such equity raise. And uh, as a lawyer, we see uh, the important role that the Norwegian investment banks play when raising capital for uh, shipping companies and uh, their strong market presence. And it would be interesting to hear, first of all, how you see this from uh, the issuer's side. Um, and if we can start off uh, uh, by you, Perry, how you see the role and, and position of the Norwegian investment banks in, uh, in raising capital for shipping companies. Sure. Uh, again, I think uh, it was already mentioned, um, uh, uh, shipping and, 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 and the related industries, that's what, uh, what the banks in Norway do. So you really see a difference between, that, um, if we look at shipping, um, there's a very strong cooperation between the investment banking teams, uh, the market side, the analysts. And it's not an, an, an off sector that um, uh, banks approach when the market is, uh, is attractive. So a very wide coverage of investment banks. So there's, uh, it's not, not one or two, but it's a, a good size number of banks active in the market. Um, we're talking about Norway, but also the international network has a very good reach in terms of um, uh, approaching investors in the US and, and outside, uh, outside Scandinavia. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, an, an antenna for what is possible in the market, because it's not only uh, straightforward uh, ECM or IPO or private placements, but they're also active in um, the bond market and other types of uh, capital raising in the markets. Um, and next to that, and, and I feel now a little bit of like uh, pitching on behalf of the investment banks, but um, the, the, the depth and the number of equity analysts active in the market covering the sector is ultimately what you want also after a listing. And so you can do the transaction and, and get investors on board via a private placement or an IPO, but you also want proper trading in your stock afterwards. And, and that's, I think, uh, where the banks also play a very important role, especially with the analysts. Thank you. Um, anything to add from your side, uh, Konstantin? Uh, I think uh, Perry covered it quite quite well. Maybe maybe one additional nuance to it uh, is, is is basically that I think the the fact that the Norwegian banks are somewhat very much committed to research, um, and that's that's the analyst part that Perry mentioned. But that that has basically two sides. One is obviously as a, as a company, um, you you know that the, the research will con will be continued even after the transaction because simply you you, you know they they have such a, such a strong focus and there's due to also the, the strong focus on shipping and the experience, there's a kind of such a network within the industry globally. And since shipping is global, global you can have this global network, network out, of, out of Norway um, with the positioning. I think it also works vis-a-vis -vis the investors. So, so the investors also turn to those banks because they, they, they kind of like the, the fact that they are committed to research, that it's, it's good research, it's, 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 it's long experience in the sector. And I think it works, works both ways because investors, some investors come and go to shipping, right? Um, and, and to have the right investors for the right time in the cycle um, identified and that's not always the same type of investor. You can only create that network and, and, and understanding of what's the right investor if you cover uh, it through the cycle in, in terms of research. So I think this is, I mean, Perry alluded to it, but maybe to, 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 to add a bit of nuance to it, this is, I think, very unique and, and differentiates it also in shipping terms from other marketplaces. Thank you, Konstantin. And uh, Matthias, how do you see this from uh, the perspective of the Oslo Stock Exchange? 
Uh, yeah, I think it was covered quite well by, by Perry and Constantine, but maybe just to add uh, a couple of things, uh, we also see the same sort of trend that, uh, or um, we have the same experience that the Norwegian banks cover shipping extremely well. And that's something you see outside of companies that are already listed in Norway. You see, you know, US-based companies or, or, or Asia-based companies that come and, and uh, list uh, or raise debt and, and list it in, in Oslo as well. But I think also an uh, important point, which which uh, is uh, was alluded to earlier, is that the fact that the industry is so volatile and the fact that the Norwegian investment banks still keep sort of this, um, this um, commitment to the sector, even if you had, you know, five or 10 very difficult years, at least for some sectors, is is something that uh, further furthers their position and uh, in the shipping equity markets uh, specifically. And uh, I think that's only going, going to continue. Thank you. So Herman, Wilhelm and Frederick, uh, lots of compliments for you uh, there. Perhaps we um, will leave with, uh, with that. <laughs> Uh, and changing subject a bit, uh, I would like also to touch upon the. Uh, I mean, if I may interrupt, because I, I think kind of one of the, and obviously it's always nice to hear the issue, you know, give credit to the, to the investment banks, but I think one of the comments that were made were extremely important uh, in terms of kind of the, when the transaction happens, that's when the work starts for the investment banks. That's when the uh, kind of risk capital has been, you know, moved over to the investors, and it's actually maintaining that kind of trust in investment, if you want, throughout the process and follow up in the aftermarket and creating liquidity in the stock. And I think it's, you know, there's what 7.8 billion investors in the world, right? Potentially, and and I think no one really, very few people wake up in the morning and think now it's time to buy uh, half now or or MPC. It, you know, that process is created by the, the banks as intermediaries between the sellers and the buyers of risk capital. And then obviously the kind of the transactions is, is when we get rewarded for that type of work. So I think that's a very important kind of thing to recognize that the Norwegian investment banks in many ways, I think, work different towards the issuer than the US banks does, which are much bigger and where individual kind of, you know, one Norwegian investment bankers do the job of three U.S. investment bankers in, in bigger bulge bracket banks. So, so I think that's a very important point uh, that was made and wanted to kind of highlight that. So yeah, that's all. Thank you, uh, thank you, Herman. Uh, moving on then to um, uh, to the uh, topic of the uh, profile of the investors uh, active in the Norwegian market. And if we can start off, uh, off with uh, you now, Herman, uh, if you can say a bit about the, the uh, investor base and the profile of the investors active in the Norwegian market. Yeah, well, I guess we kind of just started on it. Uh, you know, shipping in the capital markets is, uh, is a very small fraction of the capital markets. And, and you know, Clarkson, we have purposely decided to, to focus on our core sectors where we, we, you know, we believe we have an edge in being relevant in more, you know, multiple layers of the conversation. And what we're seeing is that, you know, again, in contrast to the US bulge bracket banks, which may have different profit centers around the world, you know, our core is really to follow the investors. So, you know, certain times the Norwegian investor base uh, has momentum and the US doesn't, or the UK or the Asia, and then kind of, you know, in that sense, uh, going a bit back to the, to the point that um, Konstantin made that having coverage of the sector through the cycle and kind of understanding what investors are you attracting attracting, and, and kind of what's the unwritten agreement in terms of uh, the, the relationship they create with investors. So I think in Norway we have, you know, everything from all over the world at any given time. In certain periods there's more like we've had a couple of years ago interest for from distressed credit funds going in and looking at shipping. And then suddenly it's private equity and then suddenly it's institutional. So, you know, this, this changes uh, throughout the cycle. And, and um, but yeah, I would say we have, you know, all type of investors in Norway. Thank you, Herman. Um, anything to add, uh, add on your side, Fredrik? Yeah, I think it, it's a good point uh, Herman is making because uh, 
basically there's a investor for every product and every market and uh, we'll come back to that a little later but i think uh, as as in in general we we have everything from uh, you know, global investors uh, reaching from Asia to the US and, and Europe, etc., uh, with uh, with different uh, preferences. And then I think uh, we uh, we have a very good uh, interaction between the investment bankers, uh, the sales force, the analysts, uh, and uh, to discuss you know who is uh, focused on what at any time. Uh, and I think for an issuer, uh, what is important is that if he's going to raise equity or he's going to do debt or he's going to do a, uh, a, let's say, bilateral lending type of uh, product, it's, it's important that uh, uh, the investment bank uh, knows their client well and, and know where to go so the process is efficient. And I think uh, for the, on, the, on the equity side, uh, we... We, we have on the ECM deals, we have a mi good mix of uh, investors from the high net worth uh, area in Oslo, but also US and UK uh, hedge fund and, uh, and also long funds. But we know exactly where to go with, with which deal. So, so that way we, we uh, achieve th two things for this year. We, we are efficient in the, in the process. And we, we will not necessarily need to expose them too broadly uh, in a process that may be a bit sensitive. Uh, so, so I think that that is uh, a, a very good strength with us. But, but for, for the question, it's which, which kind of investor it is. I, could, I, I think if we had brackets of product, if it was distressed debt or, or if it was uh, equity deals, we could put a little bit uh, various... Uh, geographical uh, areas and also, um, you know, type of investment firms in the different bracket. But that, that would take a little while. I think uh, the important thing is we, we, we have that map. <laughs> and, and I think that's something the issuer has experienced. Thank you. Wilhelm? Um, yes, on that last point, I guess the, the pie chart that uh, I recalled in this initial presentation was actually quite representative of the geographical spread that we typically see in, in the equity deals we do. I think you can, you know, rule of thumb say that it's approximately um, one third the Norway Nordics and, and one third the US and the, the remaining one third UK continental Europe. So that, that's that's typically the geographical spread that, that we see when it comes to comes to a type of investor. I think uh, going back to the point of, of risk appetite and the uh, and the um, and the, the Nordic based investors, uh, you you do clearly see early in the cycle when maybe the, the market is a bit distressed that you have the that you have the, the specialist funds and the, the Norwegian family offices um, uh, there to, to take quite substantial tickets uh, early on in the cycle. Um, uh, at, the, at the moment, you know, share prices have moved quite a bit, um, uh, earnings also. Um, and so there's a reason why things have moved. There's also a bit of a, call it a large capital flow into the market and a lot of also retail demand driving share prices. So I think at the moment, um, interest uh, in the sector is, is clearly there and the, the market is market is open, but uh, it, it's a bit more uh, difficult to pinpoint right now um, um, uh, whether it's sort of the, the, the early phase uh, risk, risk on type of investors or if it's a sort of retail generalist capital market accounts that um, that uh, is the main driver for at least demand in, 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 in primaries. Thank you, uh, Wilhelm. Uh, and Matthias, uh, turning to you, it, it would be interesting also to see uh, whether you see any changes in the uh, investor base or, or benefits as a result of now being on the Euronext uh, platform. Uh, yeah. I think um, from from the issuer uh, point of view, there's um, not too much changes that you would notice in in the everyday sort of uh, um, everyday business in that sense. But I think 
longer term, given that uh, also Burst is now integrated into the Euronext uh, platform, both on the on the trading side with a, with a joint um, trading platform with a common liquidity pool for all the stocks in, in the Euronext platform. We'll see probably some improvements, at least for some companies o- over time in terms of uh, liquidity. Uh, whether that's purely driven short term by interest, like like um, like um, Wilhelm mentioned, or or a, sort of a larger shift, is is difficult to sort of analyze in that sense. But I think that the main sort of uh, benefit for for the issuers in that sense is that the, that the visibility of the company will be much broader outside of sort of the shipping hub or cluster in in Norway, right? Which is quite quite small in terms of the overall capital market. And I think most of us here on the panel sort of know who the players are. But given that Euronext is sort of a a, a broad European uh, exchange or group of exchanges, we we hope sort of to be able to to, uh, market our our strong sectors also in in other countries. Um, And sort of more on the corporate side from from most of Burr's point of view, it's, it's also an opportunity for us to be a bit closer to our issuers, um, let's say, especially small issuers on supporting them uh, beyond the listing process with, you know, sort of um, easing the burden on, on compliance and other things that, that comes with being a listed company. So uh, overall, I think it's it's very positive and, and hopefully it's, it's something that uh, the issuers uh, will uh, notice over time. Thank you, Matthias. That's, uh, that's very good. I want to finish off by uh, using this opportunity to uh, look a bit into the future and uh, how the equity market will look like for shipping companies going forward. Fredrik, uh, to start off with you, uh, what are your predictions for the equity capital market for shipping companies going forward? Yeah, uh, thank you, Anna. Let me let me just go into the the sub uh, topic and and start off with the access to, to capital for shipping. And I think I'll start off to say there's always uh, access to capital in the Norwegian market. If the market is devastating and you're heading towards default, there will be a uh, alternative lender to give you a term sheet, although the price on the debt may be high and other terms may be a bit rough, but there will be term sheets. Then if the market is uh, super optimistic, rates are high, like we see now, uh, there will be access to cheap uh, uh, cheap uh, equity, uh, which may be driven by retails or 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 you know hedge fund or whatever. But but the equity markets are are there. So let's narrow it a bit down to the equity markets uh, because the equity markets they are uh, and the access to capital is I guess as volatile as the as the rates or maybe even more. If we look back one year uh, one year plus in in April uh, last year. We had the price to NAV on, on the dry bulk sector at 0.55, and that was on quite depressed values. Uh, and at that point, uh, uh, I think investors had forgotten that shipping is cyclical and that it will uh, come back. Uh, and uh, there were also a lot of talks that uh, fund managers were prevented for, in, um, you know, for investing in shipping because it was too dirty and it was compared with tobacco and so forth. But then, luckily, when rates come back, we were reminded that asset managers, uh, normally, uh, for them, cash is king. So everyone uh, returned uh, to to the shipping space, and we had uh, a recovery in shipping shares. Uh, Our Arctic index is up more than 70% in a year. And now we see that the the dry bulk sector is priced at 1.2 to 1.3% uh to nav at at much higher assets values so it's 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 very volatile that that market and i think that um uh, uh so so with that a little bit in mind um uh, what what will we do what will we see now of investments now that the, let's say equity market are efficient and 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 is possible to use um i think that for, for, for a few months last year or, or, or the whole last year, we saw a lot of interest in the renewable and, and the tech companies. And many of these companies are immature uh, and, uh, and they have some, uh, some of them have unproven uh, concepts. I think what we see in shipping, there's a, a merchant uh, a fleet of around 100,000 vessels. 
Uh, these vessels are very much uh, proven. And although they're not uh, fully mature, they, uh, they uh, have a long uh, remaining lifespan. Drybolt, for example, probably the oldest uh, fleet is around nine years old. So what I think is that um, we're going to see most of the, uh, you know, uh, capital markets transaction being around the existing fleet. Uh, we already saw that with Golden Ocean, raising capital, use of proceed, buying secondhand vessels, bail ship, the same thing, use of proceed, buying secondhand uh, assets, and SIM did a listing and there were no uh, financing for, for a new build program. So I think in this part of the cycle, we, we will mostly see uh, deals uh, uh, focused around the, the existing fleet. And, and, uh, and then to, to, to look a bit forward and all these ESG aspects that, that you've been asking for, um, I think that um, we learned from Ever Given that to replace 100,000 vessels worldwide uh, quickly and uh, in an efficient way is, is very difficult, although we have a lot of technology in hand uh, in 2021. So uh, I think that uh, uh, there, there will take time uh, to, to, let's say, renew the, the, the fleet in, in, in some, let's say, uh, Tesla type of, of form. Uh, I think we will see uh, some new build investments and, and capital raised for new build investments. Uh, but but many of these new builds will be on on uh, new concepts for the vessels, and and uh, I think ship owners like to have longer contracts when it comes to 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 new uh, let's say uh, uh, concepts for ships, and that will pr probably be be financed most, mostly with with uh, you know alternative debt and and maybe a minor uh, equity portion. So, yes. but you may see some deals there, uh, you know, linked to uh, ammonia and, and, and uh, others. Then I think what we will see a lot though is that um, companies uh, that are uh, serving the existing fleet, uh, companies that are uh, maintaining vessels, uh, companies that are uh, finding new concepts that improve uh, the vessel uh, to an environment, uh, environmental friendly um, way, they will probably be very interesting for investors going forward. Uh, for example, OSM Maritime is a uh, is a pure play uh, ship manager. So they will upgrade vessels. They will they will help with inspections. They help with crewing, which is you know very much a social aspect to how you're handling crew, etc. Uh, so I think those uh, type of companies uh, will will probably. Uh, you know, see a lot of interesting business forward. And I think that the, the capital markets will also look for, let's say, more maritime linked uh, service companies. And I think... My, hmm? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think we need to, um, we need to wrap up, uh, wrap up oh, now. Um, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, so, uh, but <laughs> but uh, we we should definitely have uh, continued this uh, this discussion on uh, on how the market will uh, will be for but but uh, but I'm getting uh, messages here that we uh, we are running out of time. <laughs> so uh, so I think I'll I'll thank you uh, for these uh, reflections and uh, and we can continue offline. Uh, on yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank, thank you to you. all of you for. Uh, thank you to all of you for a great panel. Really, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you and thank you, thank you, Nicholas, for uh, for arranging the forum. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.